In this, uh, this two-part series, this is how to contribute to the winning team. And the Lord, just as I've been looking at the Olympics, and again, I say thank God for the Olympics because it keeps a little bit of the politics off my television. Every time you turn on the news, it's something else. It's been a great distraction uh, from the presidential election. And so in this, we, we are getting towards the, the end of the Olympics. So this is part two, and we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter eight. And this is how to contribute to the winning team. Let me just go ahead. If you weren't here, give you the first four points uh, that we covered is one, join in unity. Two, be attentive to the Lord. Three, support the ministry. And four, honor God's word. And that's where we ended last Sunday. Uh, just this last week, I was watching something live that I, I want to show you, but... It's an interview. There are three women who did, uh, from the United States, the first time it's ever happened, they did what's called a total sweep. They took all three medals in one event. It happened in the 100-meter hurdle. And I watched it happen live, and it was amazing. It was history. But it, the interview after, NBC was uh, giving this interview, but they, I could not find that interview anywhere because the gold medalist was praising the Lord and she just was talking about how important it was and they formed a prayer circle and you're, you'll hear her talk. So I looked everywhere. NBC has erased that completely. They don't want it anywhere. But I found it one place. It was a Facebook post. I think of a family member where somebody is actually filming this live on their The television. world does not want praise like that to get out. You can talk a little bit of, about the Lord, uh, the Lord being behind uh, and, uh, your, your motives for the Olympics. And that's great. But the, what she was doing, she was talking about, she said the spirit of the Lord came upon us as we filled this prayer circle and we were able to compete. Those are her words. And it, it really, it was, it was shocking at first. But then I said, well, it, it makes sense really why that would never air anywhere uh, other than if somebody were to capture that live because it's been totally erased. But uh, it was Brianna Rollins. She won the gold medal. Uh, Nia Ali and Christy Kaslin, and they, they got the silver and the bronze medals for this event. And in their interview, they were giving glory to God because they were in unity, just like I was talking about, in unity, giving glory to his name. And so NBC did not allow this to air, but the word still went out there. When you get to the point where you're praising God, the enemy, no matter what he tries to, cannot stop it. God accepts it. He feels it. And it is a sweet sound to his ears. And he accepted that praise. He accepted that glory. And he took it all unto him. And he says, that's right. I am the reason that you, you wonderful athletes are able to do this. It says they, she said that they formed a prayer circle and the Spirit of the Lord went upon them and, and they began to glorify the Lord and that's how they went into the competition. So as a result, it was a total sweep. The first time ever that the uh, three women from the United States took one event completely. And you saw all the other countries who were there competing. They were just watching them. They were jumping around holding the flags. We're looking at how to be part of the winning team. And so we're going to continue in the book of Nehemiah, and now we're, I'm going to move through from verse 5 of chapter 8 all the way through verse 12. If you have your Bibles, let's hold it up. Let's make the declaration again. Take your Bibles, hold, hold them where you are, and repeat after me. This is my Bible. The incorruptible, indestructible, living Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. I will succeed or fail according to the promises in His Word. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. As we go through Nehemiah, again, I'll just give you a little background. There's first, they, they're there to rebuild the walls. And Nehemiah leads the people and they rebuild the walls of Jerusalem within two months. An amazing feat. Every man took his section of the wall right next to his house. And so together they rebuilt the walls around Jerusalem. But then they went from a physical revival 
to a revival of the Spirit. And that's where we get right around Nehemiah chapter 8, where some great things happen. And Ezra, the scribe, he holds the word. And the word back then, we call it's, people call it the Pentateuch. That means the first five. Pentateuch five. The first five books of the Bible, which Moses penned through the Spirit of the living God. It is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You have the video? Okay, let's play the video. And let's see if we can get some good sound out of this. Turn off the lights and just watch this. I'm glad they're able to get it. Ladies, they made it around the track. And Brianna, for you, early happy birthday. You came in here as a huge favorite. How did you live up to that for gold? Man, I just, just kept God first and just continued to let him um, guide me throughout the rounds. And we all, we, we, we formed a prayer circle this morning. And we just let his, his, his presence come upon us and just help us come out here and continue to glorify him and, and do the best that we can. And, and that's what we did. Well, Nia, you have little Titus Maximus with you now, but your mom had him in the stands. How did you stay focused for 10 hurdles to grab the silver? I mean, I knew it was going to take just a lot of just discipline. And I knew it was going to be very hard to even just medal because everyone was going out there with the same goals in mind. I was just happy that me and these ladies were able to pull it off because we prayed hard about this and we didn't let the distractions get to us. So we They were together, and it says, they helped the people understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book and the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, as with the peace, priests and the scribes and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions for those whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to the Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions, and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. Father God, again, take your word. Father, we pray that you will speak through your word. Let your will be done. We praise you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The next point, the next thing that you can do to be part of this winning team is you see it right here. It takes place in verse 6. They facilitated worship. They began to worship. It reminds me of this older lady who had a hard time with contemporary worship, and she was really stuck with the, the older way of worship. And she's complaining about this particular song that was used in worship. She's complaining to her friend, and her friend said, Why, that's not a new song. That's really, it's a, a very old song. It's just been sang to a different tune now. David sung that song to Saul. And the lady said, well, now for the first time, I understand why Saul threw, threw that javelin at him while he was singing that song. When we get in our minds, when we hear that word worship, we automatically think music. We think that it is all about the music, but it's not. That's not really what worship is. It's about how we relate to God on a daily basis. That is worship. Worship is relationship with the living God. And that is what true worship is. There's this great worship pastor, and his name's Tony Evans. And he says, if you limit worship to where you are, the minute you leave the place of worship, you will leave your attitude of worship behind like a crumpled up church bulletin. That is like your worship. Your worship must be in here when we come, but it must be out there when you go. You're coming and you're going when you wake up in the morning, when you lay down your head in your bed at night. It is all worship. Sunday worship should be an extension of your worship lifestyle. It should recharge your worship batteries. 
and give you this new song until the following Sunday when we all meet together again and we worship again. So it is like the Energizer Rechargeable that I take out of my battery pack and I, I plug Recharge. In. When I go again, take it out, I have fresh batteries because they are recharged. That is the worship that we have. In verse 6 of Nehemiah, what happens? After reading the God's Word, we see two types of worship here. First, there's this loud, audible worship with shouts and gladness, and they're praising the Lord. Then there we see this deep reverence for the Lord, where they bow, they place themselves on the ground before the Lord. They're both acts of worship. Both are very pleasing to the Lord. Both the raising the hands and shouting and glorifying Him and worshiping, and then having the quiet, still time with the Lord and honoring Him, and honoring His presence. It's all worship, and it, all, it honors the Lord. So worship is relationship with God in action. By showing up to that meeting, the Jews are returned from exile. They're making a display that they were not too busy, that they could not take time out of their week, and they could not stand there and hear the Word of the Lord for four hours. Now, I know that's asking a lot. Four hours of just hearing the words of the Lord, but they were hungry. A hungry people are not afraid to worship, and they will not put a time on their worship, they will just go after God and see what happens. I pray every Sunday that God would just take over. God would just have His way. That God would just be God to us and we would just be His children and we would just sing praises to Him, but He would ultimately have it, receive it, and take over completely. I really don't want to facilitate anything. I just want to be all spirit-led, all by God, and just go off of His leading. That's worship. So they are standing there, showing up for that event in itself was an act of worship. When you take time out of your weekend and come to this worship service, you are making God a priority, and you are participating in worship. Then you have the opportunity to praise the Lord. You have an opportunity to give unto the Lord. You have an opportunity to make His name holy in your world. That's worship. Your action in praise is your worship to God. He receives your worship. He delights in your praise. And then when you take time to get quiet and pray and reflect and bow before the Lord, He's also pleased because why? We are fulfilling our very purpose for being. You and I were created for worship. We are created for this. We are created for relationship. To the Lord. And so when we line up with what we were really created for, God will do something. That's where He begins to move. We are created for this in all its many forms. And both the praise and the worship and the giving and the prayer and getting quiet before the Lord, we are made for this. Worship gets God's attention. If you ever feel like that you're, you're out in, in the world and, and you cannot get through and there's no breakthrough whatsoever, you want to get God's attention, you start to worship. You begin to praise Him. It will get His attention. He will show up in your life. When you, we are serious enough to put our feelings to actions. That's why it's okay to raise our hands. It's okay to shout hallelujah to the Lord. It's okay to get out of your seat and maybe even get in the aisle if you need a little moving room and just worship Him. That's okay. It's okay to shout praises. It's okay when the Word and the message is getting forward to say amen. Let's try that. Amen. amen. It's okay. Amen. That is worship. That is part of the whole worship. It's okay to confirm the word and the message. You know, I once delivered a message in a predominantly African-American congregation, and, I, I, and, and they asked me to come, and really, I didn't even know I was going to preach, but they just handed me the microphone, okay? And, and, I, and they said, you got a word. And, but let me tell you, their worship team never left the platform. They stayed up there. 
you ever been to one of those just real lively services, and I would start talking in the worship scene, the worship team would just back me up, okay? I would talk, and then the drums would start going, and the keyboard would start playing. I was like, whoa, I like this. And I started going, I got heated up, and they started getting heated up with me. But let me tell you what happened. They just sucked everything I had out of me. I, I left that place slapped wore out. Because they pulled it out of me. You know what I'm saying? They pulled it and they pulled it. By the time it was over, I was just like, I was, oh my goodness. I mean, I was just wringing wet, but I know that I, that, that, that I had given it all to the Lord because it was encouraging and they were with me and it was exciting and the, and the drums would take off and there's a keyboard and there's a little bit of dancing and stuff going on. I was like, yeah, man, like this. Get my da -da. Man, I like it. I like it. I think sometimes we, come, we get so dignified. We get so dignified that we feel like we're above all that. That we are above all the shaking and raising the hands and just saying hallelujah to the Lord. Listen, we're not, we're not all that dignified. You just need to, I'm not talking about making a show. I'm just talking about cutting loose in front of the Lord and showing Him our praise and showing Him our worship. That's, that's what David did. There was this time we can read that he danced before the Lord in worship as the Ark of the Covenant was brought in and he began to dance and his wife was just upset. She was angry. She was embarrassed for his actions. And I'm going to tell you why. Because David had a relationship with the Lord. David's wife... Michael was her name. She had a relationship with David, but she did not have a relationship with the Lord. That was Saul's daughter. So she had no relationship with the Lord, yet her only connection to the Lord was through David. So therefore, when David began to dance and do his thing before the Lord, and he was, I mean, they were stomping and dancing, and they were leading the Ark of the Covenant in, winding through the streets... They were getting it. And he was like, and she was like, oh my goodness, that is not the way we do church. That is, that is not of God. Well, I'm going to tell you. God saw David's praise. He saw David's worship and he accounted it as holy unto him. He saw her attitude and saw that it was contrary to the worship. It was contrary to the praise, and it was not of God at all. So the next time, let me just say that, that, that you feel like somebody next to you is going a little too far, check your own personal relationship. Check yourself. Examine yourself. And I'm not saying one way or other, only you can do that, but if you are feeling a little irritated because somebody's raising their hands a little too much, and you're like, you kind of move over because maybe their hands get a little close to you. You're like, man. Eh. You know, check yourself. God wants our worship, and that's what he received that day. And next we go to verse 7 is my next point. Verse 7 and 8. What happens is something really great. It wasn't just the word that was going forth. All those names that I mentioned in the Levites... They went through the crowd, and I don't know how it happened. It's, it, I'm trying to figure it out, you know, and, it, and I, maybe there are some pauses in between, but they went through and started asking the people, do you understand what you're being taught? Do you understand this? Do you understand this? And they were, they were, giving, they were teaching to the Word what was being read. The second thing that you can do to be part of the winning team is be teachable. Be teachable. They were going out, those who were, had already been taught. They were trained, they were taught, so they, they, are, they, have been, they have studied the Word before. They were going out and asking the people, do you understand? Do you have any questions? Now's the time for questions. Do, do you need us to explain this? So there's a lot of accountability going here. Someone once said, a Bible in the hand is worth... Two in the bookcase. Someone else said a Bible stored in the mind is worth a dozen stored in the bottom of someone's trunk. Here's a pop quiz. Which of the following 
Which of the following are not in the Bible? If it's not in the Bible, raise your hand. It is interactive here. Cleanliness is next to godliness. If that's not in the Bible, raise your hand. If it's not in the Bible, raise your hand. God helps those who help themselves. If it's not in the Bible, raise your hand. Confession is good for the soul. If it's not in the Bible, raise your hand. We are as prone to sin as sparks fly upwards. If it's not in the Bible, raise your hand. If it's not in the Bible, raise your hand. I'm going to tell you in a minute. Money is the root of all evil. If it's not in the Bible, raise your hand. All right, I got one more. Honesty is the best policy. If it's not in the Bible, raise your hand. Here's the, here, here, here's the thing. All of these are true, probably true, partially true, but none of them are actually in the Bible. None of them are in the Word of God. Not one. We have learned to treat man's opinion with as much authority as God's Word. And it's just good sayings that we've heard. Now, there may be part of that, like the, the love of money is the root of all evil. That is, that is a rendition of the Word that has been changed, and it's not really what the Word says. So it's close. So there were some tricky ones in there. So we've learned to trust man's opinion and put it on the same pedestal as God's Word. D.L. Moody, a, a great man of God, said the Scriptures were not given for our information, but for our transformation. How many can say, by raising your hand again, that you have read the Bible all the way through? No matter how many times that you've read the Word... And it's great that you have. The point is to let it go through you. Don't just read the Word. You've got to digest the Word. You've got to become a student of the Word. You've got to let the Word move through you. See, God's Word is like engine coolant in a garage in a shop that's supposed to go in the car. It does no good on the shelf. Engine coolant only does good in your car. What does it do? It keeps your car from overheating. It regulates the temperature in your car. If it's never put in your car and it's left on the shelf in your garage, your car is going to overheat. Then you'll be thinking, maybe I should have put the engine coolant in my car where it belongs. The Word of God, it does nothing for you on your shelf, on your table, in your car where the sun's cooking it and, and it's starting to peel up. It does nothing for you until you open it up and you get it inside of you. That's where the Word of God belongs. Last Wednesday when we were here, we, you know, we, we got into the Word and I took a little sidestep and, and I, I made a first-time discovery and I, and I was looking and, and through two different commentaries and I was looking at this, it appears that two of Jesus' disciples appear to be His cousins. I've never heard that before. And I started reading and looking a little more and you just had to bend there. I'm not going to explain all of it, but it makes sense. Now that this mother came to Jesus and said, listen, I have a request for you, Jesus. And, and she said, he said, well, what is it? What do you want? And he says, I want that my boys want to sit on your right and want to sit on your left. It makes sense if these boys were his cousins. They were family because now we're talking about um, they feel like they're entitled to something because they're related to Jesus. So it really makes sense there. And what does that mean with, with the, the scope of salvation? It really doesn't mean a lot, but you don't get little tidbits, what I call breadcrumbs in Scripture, where you, you take a Scripture and you cross-reference it with this one, and you get another one, and you get a chain of reference. You can't do that. You cannot discover things like that. You cannot get really deep into the Word unless you become a student of His Word. We get more out of the Bible when we let it get into us instead of just around us. So all these facts, and it's just simply a product of just being a student, just having a teachable spirit. The people in the days of Nehemiah, they, they not only rebuilt the walls in two months' time, but they, they did this and they had revival because they made God's Word a priority and they developed a teachable spirit. They began to digest 
the living word of God and they begin to get it into them, then it really instituted change in their own lives. And so those who are going through, they facilitated accountability. I am accountable for the things that I teach to you. I'm accountable. And if you're confused with anything, it is my responsibility to make sure that I am clear. And if I'm not, it's my responsibility to have an open door. And when you call me and say, I'd like to meet with you and to explain what it is I was talking about, because I don't ever want to cause confusion. That is my responsibility, but it's your responsibility to be teachable. And let me just say, I'm not always a teacher. You're not always a student. Today I may teach, but tomorrow you may teach, and, and you're going to teach me something. I need to listen to you. And I can never develop the I-know-it-all attitude because there's always something. Many things that I don't know, and it's you who can teach me. So we are all teachers, and we're all students. We're all teaching, and we're all learning all at the same time. As long as we focus on the Lord and His teachings and the Holy Spirit will be the ultimate teacher, He says He dwells within us. It will be like the two men walking down the road that after Jesus was crucified, they were talking about it and this teacher came up and began to explain the Scriptures to them. And then they were listening and they understood it. And then when the teacher left, they realized it was Jesus Himself who was walking with them. He said, that was, that was Jesus we didn't realize it, but that was Jesus who was teaching us the scriptures. It'll, it'll be just like that. I found that when I just, when I focused on him through my life every time and just focused and just, and just became a vessel, I became less and he became more. That's when God can do great things. So, yeah, I guess, let me just plug our classes that are starting, our life group classes. You are not beyond having a teachable spirit. You are not beyond learning. I want to see each and every person to make learning from God's Word a priority in getting involved in a, a session where you can hear from God through His Word. When we start up, I, I, want to see, I want to see our classes full. I want to see these life group classes full to the point where the teachers are overwhelmed with, with all the people who are coming. That would just praise the Lord. And the teacher said, oh my goodness, yeah, it's going to be great. But it takes a people who are willing to learn to get involved. In Nehemiah, the people's lives were changed forever because they remained teachable. In verse 9 through 11, what happened next is they left in victory, not in defeat. God wants you and I to not only have the victory, but more importantly, to see it and recognize it. Even if it's not what we imagined it to be, when you look at your life and you see it now and say, wow, I really never thought my life would end up like this. God wants to give you the victory even in the circumstances that you're in and see it the way He sees it. It's like a race. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also all who have longed for His appearing. Every person who draws closer to the Lord in every walk of life, there's this feeling of remorse over past sin, over past things. I want you to listen to me very closely what I'm about to say. God has forgiven us. We need to forgive ourselves. Satan is the destroyer. And he goes around to God's children and he always takes all those things that you've done and he always puts it right in front of you. Right in front of you. It's like an obstacle in the race, and you want you to trip over it. And a lot of people, they focus on that, so they can't even run a good race because that thing is that past that we are holding on to. God says, I've forgiven you of that. Let it go. I've forgiven you. You need to forgive yourself. There's no condemnation against us in Christ Jesus. Satan, he's a liar, and you call him a liar, and God doesn't even recognize those very things that he's placing in front of you. That belonged to a person who you buried. He is dead. He is no longer. He's no longer in you. When you receive Christ as your personal Savior, that 
thing, that person who was is no longer, you're a new creation in Christ. Forgive yourself. Bury that old person. Become the new creation. Every time you mess up, you have the ability to ask forgiveness, make it right with God. So don't ever leave this house, this church in defeat. Leave in victory. And that's what, that's what the, the leaders of Nehemiah told and said, don't cry, why are you crying? This is a great day to rejoice. This is time to have a feast. Go out and share with those. Share with those people. And this is where I close in the final verse, verse 12. You've got to allow God to change you. Allow God to change you. When they left, they left change. This is a story I'm going to close with. Richard, why don't you come up and get ready? There's this pastor. He, th he thought, he knew, he knew, he had a great idea that he presented it to the quarterly board meeting to the elders. And after giving his most impassioned plea and really selling the idea to the elder board, the board voted and they voted down the pastor's proposed changes 12 to 1. And the head elder looked at the pastor and said, Well, pastor, it's 12 to 1 votes. Looks like you've been voted out. Looks like uh, time's up for the evening, so will you please close in prayer? So the pastor, he said, All right, I got one more chance. So he gets back and he begins to pray, Lord, I know my brothers here do not have the same vision you've given me. Please help them to see this is not my vision, but your vision. At that exact moment, a lightning bolt came through. And it, with a loud clap of thunder, burst through the window in the meeting room, striking the table, splitting it in two, and knocking all the elders to the floor. As the dust cleared, the pastor looked at the head elder and said, Huh, so what do you think about that? The head elder Dusted himself off and said, well, I guess that's 12 votes to two then. <laughs> a meeting with God should end in change. It should end in change. When it's really God, we just need, we need to recognize it's God. And guess what? It's okay to vote against the pastor. But when you know it's your heart and he's tugging you and you realize this is God's vision for the house... If it's ever you against God, you're going to lose. If it's ever me against God, I'm going to lose. You can go ahead and start playing. He's in the people changing business. And in Nehemiah 8, the leaders, they gave instruction. They headed off in a new direction and new attitude. It was a great victory and now is the time to celebrate. It says they understood the words of the Lord. Lord the words of the law, they said, now they would... They're going to take this information. They're going to make the transformation for the future. Your worship and dedication will not amount to anything if you don't take it and do something with it. You've got to take what he gives you and allow it to change you. Otherwise, it does no good. Allow his word to mold you. To something new, something different, something different than drove up and parked in this parking lot and walked through these doors this morning. Allow it to change you. Change will not only benefit you, it'll benefit others around you. It says what happened is some had food and some didn't. So those who didn't have food, they were blessed by those who did. As they were worshiping, they gave to those who had no food. The change in your life will facilitate a change in the lives of others. But you got to let it change you first. And if you don't let it change you, it can't change anybody else. The next chapter over, they were so excited about this new revival, they said, let's do it again. And the next day they realized there's something they weren't doing. In two weeks time, they're going to have, they're supposed to have this feast called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. So they went out and they all got a uh, brush and they built themselves portable uh, structures out in the wilderness. 
They did this because the Lord commanded them to do it, yet they've never listened to it before. They've never adhered to the command of the Lord. So when they did it, it caused such a great revival. And that is something that you see in Israel to this day. They go out and they get out in the wilderness and they make themselves portable tents. Now we actually have the nylon tents with a zipper and it's really cool. Truth be known, that is what we get our modern day camping from is this story right here. When they got out into the wilderness and they decided to camp out because it recognizes Israel in the wilderness in their portable tents. And so for generations and generations around fall, this time of year, there's people who go and they decide, hey, let's go out and go camping. They don't even realize what they're doing and why, why they're doing it. And they celebrate what the Lord told them to celebrate so many years ago. Here's my point in all this. Your dedication to the Lord, if you allow Him to change you, it'll change you. It'll change your immediate surroundings. But it has the potential to change generations. Generations. Not just you in your own bubble, in your own world. Generations after you can be changed if you allow the change to take place in you first. The revival has to start in you, in your home. It's got to start with you.